let us come together in a spirit of unity. Let's recognize what makes us the same, a desire for health, for happiness, for the right to pursue them, a desire for freedom and to have a voice, a desire to think for ourselves and to have that desire affirmed by our culture. We have so much that separates us. To list our differences would make an endless number. What binds us is such a short list by comparison, but the list is so powerful that it demolishes our differences into so much background chatter, if we only allow it. Give thanks for what unites us and give space for what divides us. It is fear which divides and love which unites.
great light bind us all one to another. May this small flame know its true greatness and the miracle of its existence. May it find its way into the deepest fibers of our struggles and trials, that they may be seen for what they truly are, proof of our one great and unified reality. Let's talk about something easy and comfortable, money. Now this is a very challenging subject for people, especially in a spiritual context. But how we spend our money is a spiritual act. Make no mistake. It's about what we put our faith in. We can't stick our heads in the soil when it comes to how we spend our money in the world. And we must consider a few things when spending it. For what we water will grow. The wolf we feed is the one who survives. What's your general rule of thumb when spending money? For most of us, we buy what's convenient, affordable, and has a level of quality to it that we're willing to sacrifice to various degrees according to convenience and affordability. You get what you pay for. That's how we shop, most of all of us, almost every time. Few of us ever spend very much time considering what it actually is that we're really purchasing when we buy something. Some of us know full well what's at stake, but we justify our behavior because of convenience and affordability. But you get what you pay for. We have expectations of the things we purchase. So check your expectations for a moment. What do you really expect from the dollar you spend? Do you expect that dollar to save the world? <laughs> you darn well should. 
Since this is a heavy subject, I'll bring in a few sources. The Buddha, Confucius, Jesus, and even a little Ben Franklin. In many ways, they all say the same thing, however. Spoiler alert, it's all about mindfulness and love. Buddhist teachings say that money viewed through the principles of right view, right thought, right speech, and right conduct help one to perceive their own money as a positive influence in the world, as honored as any form of abundance, yet still cautioning against attachment to it. Now, to remove attachment from our money is not to give it away, it's to spend it enjoyably and wisely and compassionately because we are more relaxed about it. And when we're more relaxed, we make better decisions about where to spend and what to sell. When we are relaxed into our best version of ourselves, we are able to take the time to see a broader list of ethical choices we often miss when we're busy and frustrated. When we're like that, we just want to get dinner over with, get the school clothes for the kids, whatever, so long as it fits. They don't complain and it's cheap, I don't care. (laughs) But those are the moments when we must care the most. This from Ben Franklin. He that is of the opinion money will do everything may well be suspected of doing everything for money. If you think money will make you happy, you'll put all of your resources toward it. Because happiness is what we desire most as a species. We will do almost anything to cause our happiness and to prevent our sadness. So if you think, I could be happy, if only I could win a million dollars, a million dollars will make me happy, a lot of people would agree with you but none of them would be right. The money itself will not provide you happiness. You could use a million dollars in many ways, and some of them could legitimately make you happy, probably many of them. But unless you're taking the Buddha's advice when spending it, it will be gone, and with it, your expectation of happiness. And for those who worship money, who do not win it in a lottery, they will do literally anything to get it. But those who imagine the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence never had to fertilize it. Confucius said, Wealth and rank are what people desire, but unless they're obtained in the right way, they may not be possessed. See, here too, it's all about the fertilizer. Unless they are grown in the right way, the flowers will fall over and be useless to the bees. The Gospel of Matthew quotes Jesus as saying, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I actually don't agree with that. Well, I agree with what I think it truly means, but I don't agree with how it is commonly interpreted. I respect the interpretations because I think it's logical to conclude that money and God are mutually exclusive by reading words like this. When reading them alone, what other conclusion can one draw? The advice here is, Pick one, because you can't have your cake and eat it too. But what if that is not the wisdom nugget that fits here? We say that we cannot serve two masters, and that is true, but the secret here is that one can exist within the other, but not the other way around. Let's extract for the moment what we shall consider God in this context. It's not about a belief in a deity, although that perspective is also valuable. In this context, God means in the service of God's wishes, or more specifically, in the service of your neighbor. It is possible to spend money with the consideration of the impact it makes upon your neighbor and upon ourselves. It is possible to consider the wishes of God when spending our money. It is possible to consider the best wishes of this planet when spending our money. And so while I think it is true in one sense that you cannot serve both God and money as if they were two separate masters, I do believe that one can be served through the other for mutual benefit. I believe this scripture verse is trying to say that if God is your master, in other words, if humankind is your source for compassionate action, you could only spend your money in the service of humankind. Money is the tool of a master, not the master itself. You can be as wealthy as Midas, and if human progress is your master, you will recognize the great power for good that comes with your abundance. I've known good wealthy men and women, philanthropists, community servants. They are many in our country's history. I know which master they served. And for all their wealth, it wasn't money. 
Scripture and other sacred texts from around the world are not against money. They're advising against using it in vain. They're advising against worshiping it for its own sake. I believe that love can exist anywhere. I've seen what the rich can do with money when they have integrity. The temptation to become corrupt is real, but not futile to resist. Our culture has made us ashamed of money, mostly because we see what many people who have it do with it, and we are ashamed of many of them. We have a complicated relationship with money because we need it at the same time as we are afraid of it, or feel unworthy of it, or believe to our core that we are poor and always will be. This is the way of thinking that complicates our relationship with money and commercialism both. This is the way of thinking that makes us feel the victim of commercialism rather than recognize that our vulnerability is an illusion. We are the ones with the dollars, folks. If they want them, they need to be more accountable for how they get them from our hands. And if we have them, we have to be more accountable for how we spend them. So here we are on the subject of capitalism. And just so that we have a common playing field for the sake of the conversation, let's check the definition. Capitalism, noun, an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than by the state. The root word capital as a term means money and wealth used to produce more money and wealth. That's what the word capital means. According to Merriam-Webster, capitalism works by encouraging competition in a fair and open market. And there's the clue. Our markets are neither fair nor open. Ergo, capitalism becomes too easily twisted and corrupt, and the system which surrounds it supports the continuation of that model. It's why the income gap in this country is especially unbalanced. It's why the truly rich are so few and the truly poor are so many. The markets are not fair. They are biased in favor of the belief that we cannot be both good and wealthy. In the United States, however, we are not purely capitalist. Now, the opposite of capitalism is socialism, where all business is controlled by the community as a whole. And whether or not we choose to comprehend it, we are actually a combination of both. In truth, we in the United States are a socialist people who operate under an economic philosophy of capitalism as its self-sustaining model. We are socio-capitalists. A purely capitalistic society would have no public schools, no public parks, no social services, and the roads would need to be maintained by the businesses and residents using them. There would be no taxes, because you would pay for every service you use. Life would be entirely a la carte. A purely capitalist society would never allow state-owned liquor stores or state-run gambling or state-run health care, so let's make sure that we know what we're talking about when it comes to whether or not we truly seek socialism as a model of life here in America. But must all capitalism be free from integrity? Capitalism, by definition, is value neutral. It's neither good nor bad. It's much like a car. Sitting in the driveway, a car does neither harm nor help. It just sits there until an operator shows up. Until it has a driver, it's little better than a concept. But once a licensed driver is behind the wheel, it becomes a potential vehicle for transformation, freedom, change, and growth. It also holds the potential to be a deadly weapon. It has the power to terrorize, pollute the air, and remembering Stephen King's film Christine even play the villain in a movie. But there was also Herbie the Love Bug. <laughs> Capitalism, like cars, can go either way, just like people. Conscious capitalism is born of an awareness that the car can be driven anywhere. It can be electric, it can be carpool, it can be fun and fancy and free while still remaining mindful of the impact it makes upon the world. So who's trying to convince us otherwise? How come we don't realize that we are the ones with all the power? Because we listen to quacks, charlatans, <laughs> Ignorant practitioners of mindless, selfish commerce, dishonesty, and even death masquerading as public service. Corrupt corporations have done much to destroy this planet and its people in an attempt to sell them something. They are guilty of the worst crimes against humanity. Make no mistake about that. But their power, just like their fear, it's all an illusion. 
But we must now put these things in order. We must understand what the real pecking order is around here and start asserting our right as consumers to stand up to the quacks who would murder us for a dollar. We must demand fair treatment for workers, fair markets, fair pricing, consciously raised food, workers' rights. And we assert these things by putting our money where our mouth is. Stand up to the quacks. Support the companies that do well by doing good. They already exist. Support social enterprise that partners the for-profit and non-profit worlds. They are not mutually exclusive. And many of us, even the companies themselves, often don't realize that is what they're already doing. Social enterprise, credit unions, Paul Newman's food company, examples of doing well by doing good already exist. Let's make more of them. Vote with your money and put some thought into it. There are good people in this world who need our support and we can do it best by doing what we already do every day. Buy stuff, but buy it mindfully. If you're a meat eater, insist on the ethical treatment of domesticated animals. If you're a vegan or vegetarian, be sure that your foods are as ethical as you are. And when business leaders say it's not cost effective to be good, they'll learn soon enough how wrong they have been. You have all the power to define this world. Now go out there and use it. Be at ease now and breathe. If you wish, you may close your eyes. Take another deep breath and hold it for a moment before letting go. Expand and stretch your lungs as far as you can make them go and then retain that sense of expansion for a moment before slowly exhaling as deeply as you can. Empty all of the air. Picture your breath coming in and out as a slow and smoothly rolling ebb and flow in and out. Fill and empty. Notice now your body. Search around to feel if it's out of alignment anywhere. Do you notice that you're leaning in one direction slightly? Correct it. Align your body. And breathe. Far in the distance, you notice someone. You're not close enough to see who they are, even what gender they are. But you recognize they are a fellow human. You are not afraid. You feel strong. I'd like you to now do something a little brave. In your mind, I'd like you to wish that person well not knowing who they are, not knowing what they stand for, not knowing if they're on your side or against you. Simply wish them well. Imagine pouring over them a liquid light filled with inner peace, comfort for their fears, for they are as real as your own and your power to heal them is too. I'd like you to now do something courageous. I'd like you to walk toward them with your hand extended in your mind, inviting them to shake it. As you get closer, you begin to see them more clearly you begin to recognize that this is a person you have not viewed as being on your side. This is not your friend. But your hand still reaches forward. You have not stopped walking toward them. 
You have not given up. This person feels like an enemy, and in many ways they are. But you are a warrior of light, and no harm shall come to you. As you continue to walk toward them, breathe in compassion, exhale fear. Breathe in empathy, exhale resentment. Open your mind's eye and see through them, see into them, see their wounds, their humanity, and breathe. Witness their divine spark. See it on them, before them, emanating from within. Be a friend to it. Greet it in your mind. Fan the flame of it and breathe. Wish them peace. You are safe. Wish them comfort. Wish them grace. Wish them health. If you struggle with it, notice that. Encourage yourself to carry on. This is the greatest test of which the spirituality of this world advises us toward. This is the great challenge of compassionate action, praying for those who would hurt us, diminish us, those who would defeat us if given the chance. Bless them. For in the unity of all things, they are you and still your hand reaches forward. Still you move toward them. You are close enough now to speak in friendly tones, but no words are necessary. They just get in the way sometimes. Their hand now rises to meet yours. It is a good sign. There is no real threat here. And you begin to feel safer now. Your fear is now a little bit smaller than your sense of relief. You shake their hand. It is warm and dry. It feels nicer than you thought it would. You both smile. You do not need to change their mind or prove to each other who is correct. What is correct is correct is correct. It doesn't need us to fight its battles. Correct seeks its own level over time and fools us by rising and falling, progress and regress the ebb and flow of democracy as it reinvents and recalibrates and evolves within us. Sometimes painfully, but always with courage and defiance against returning to the ways of our darkest past in favor of the safety we imagine we know must be possible. If only the other side would just listen but listening is not the same as hearing. Hear their pulse now. Hear their humanity in spite of their views. Hear their life. Forgive them. Just for this brief moment. Just for the island of inner peace it will bring to you. Just for a few sacred moments. See the humanity in the one you fear. 
and see if you have the courage to set aside what separates you long enough to genuinely pray for their peace. Your prayer may not reach them, but it will reach you. Take one final breath and return.